many questions from all around the world, which is really fabulous to see, um, and many regards from places as far flung as Zimbabwe and Alabama. So um, it's really exciting to see that. Um, I, I think there been there's there are questions on many levels, but there are some specific questions about the climate school and how it's going to be how the education programs are going to be organized. Will there be a building? Um, is there a five year plan? All of these things that I know you have answers to. So um, I want to give you a chance, I think, um, to talk a little bit more specifically for those people who who are really curious about, um, you know, what does the climate school look like in 2022, and what will it look like, you know, in 2025? Um, and and in, I think, and in, in maybe to build a bridge a bit between Safwan's comments about activism. I think I know we've had many conversations. Or what are the core things that students in a climate school need to know so that they can go and be trained to be change agents in the world? So I, I'd like to give you both a chance to talk a little bit about um, some of the specifics about the school. I think people are really interested to know how it's going to be structured, built, where it will sit and what the educational programs look like. Oh, I can, yeah, I can start I on the education yeah. programs. Yeah. I'm going to continue the analogy uh, with public health that we've had running through this discussion. And uh, if you think about a public health, the master's of public health, that is like a recognized flagship degree. Someone has an MPH, they can be employed in a, you know, a hospital or school, or that is a, you know, like a, definitive degree. We don't have currently a pro, uh, degree like that in climate, where you'd say that someone who has that degree is conversant in understanding climate and all its societal ramifications. That's what we want to create, that kind of flagship degree and the curriculum to support that, that, uh, that puts change agents out in the world who have a recognized, over time, a, a recognizable degree that, um, that is analogous to say an MPH or a master's of social work or you know, other kinds of degrees that put recognized as professionals out in the world. So as I said, we don't yet have that, this is new, and we're building the curriculum. So that curriculum needs to contain basic understanding of climate, clearly, but certainly well beyond to be able to, um, to understand the policy, the international dimensions, the, the justice and equity dimensions, uh, the way, similarly, the way that public health built up that kind of core content. So we're in the process of building that, that core content for a flagship master's degree in climate. And I'd say we could, we could think that in uh, less than 100 years, maybe in 10, 20 years, there will be a degree in climate, master's in climate, that is analogous to these other types of um, professional degrees. Along with that goes all kinds of other things that, that we want to build out. Uh, which will take a little time. It's not going to happen in next month, but we'll take some time, build out summer programs, experiences, different ways of delivering content, uh, case studies, ways that, uh, ways that can create this workforce that we need. Ruth, can I follow up on that? And maybe Alex, you, you when jumping, because I think there, there are some of the questions in the chat speak to, you know, how will you incorporate um, academic knowledge and expertise, both from sort of the social sciences, as well as the business school and engineering um, and the law school, because there are those intersections, I think, as we've talked about, are all critically important. And so I know you've given a lot of thought too to how not only the education programs, but how the research programs will intersect with these broad range of sciences that we have here. Ruth, do you want to talk about the education first? Well, on the education side, clearly, uh, the, our collaborations with the other schools are critical and are being built with Mailman School of Public Health, with the business school, uh, with engineering, and to be able to, we're working with these other schools to develop the content for um, specializations within our master's program. So a climate finance specialization, for example, which we're working on in collaboration with, um, with the business school or you know, mitigation <laughs> specialization, working with 
engineering. So we're building building this content with with the other schools because we recognize that um, that in the climate school we're not doesn't make sense to try to recreate all that expertise. We have so much expertise at Columbia throughout these uh, throughout and, and the I don't university. Think and I think in the conversations we've had in, in many planning meetings, I don't think there's a, 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 any of the schools from the School of Medicine to the School of Social Work to the School of Engineering that is not included in, in these conversations. Absolutely. Journalism, <laughs> yeah. across the board. And the arts and sciences and the humanities. I mean, humanities. So, so incredibly important. The, we need the, uh, be, beyond the statisticians, right? We need the anthropologists and we need sociologists and we need the political scientists. I mean, you know, the fact that um, the next COP is going to be in Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt, uh, you know, brings home uh, the uh, security and political dimensions, of course, of, of climate change, which are very much alive in this part of the world. Uh, I say this because I'm, um, I'm joining you from Amman, Jordan. <laughs> Julie, back to you. Um, Alex, do you want to talk maybe a little bit more about research collaborations as well as um, will there be a building is a question I've seen a few times um, and uh, where will the labs sit that are so let me let me tee that up for you. That's <laughs> uh, great. I, I actually looked at some of the questions. It's great to see Antoine Claire from Paris is on the line from um, uh, Renzo Piano. Yeah. So he's they're the architects for the building. So and they've got a great vision about how to build carbon neutrality into our into our what we're trying to do. Um, so it's been great to think about that. Yes, we're building a new building on Manhattanville. It's going up uh, on what's called Site Four, which is um, uh, will be next right next to the business school and, and behind the forum. And um, it's a it's a, a big building, bigger than we need for the climate school in the first instance. But then uh, one of the key things about as we've been talking about is that. This climate school involves the whole university pretty much. So um, we've got the opportunity to bring in partners from other parts of the university to, to have their schools have a footprint inside the building as well uh, and work together and create this amazing environment. So one of the things that, um, which goes back to what we were just saying is that when we first did two years ago, when we first, I think when I first met you, Julie, uh, I went around the various schools to actually find out, um, talk about the climate school ideas and, and thinking this idea of building the school. And it was, became apparent, we did a, a survey to find out how much activity there was in climate and, and sustainability act, uh, research across Columbia. And we found that um, two things. One is that every school, including the School of Dentistry, is interested in climate change, you know? So everybody's interested in it, English department, music department, they all really want to focus on climate going forward. And the history department told me they could they could actually hire, you know, all their next faculty could be people working on the interface between climate and history and how it's changed history over time. This is such an exciting area for so many parts of the university. And of course, engineering is, is building up huge strength in this area as well. So it makes no sense to to um, to try and build a school that's separate from all of that. You want to harness that in a very powerful way. Um, and the and, and what became very clear is that we should build a sort of hub and spoke structure. So we will build a hub for the climate school, but there will be connections and support, and both from the point of view of um, networking and providing joint activity, getting people jointly involved on programs, uh, education, as Ruth has been talking about, but also from the point of view of even faculty hiring, that we'll be doing joint faculty hiring with various schools. You know, we're going to need to recruit engineers to tackle the climate crisis. We're not building a new engineering school in, uh, department inside the climate school, but we can actually work to help engineering expand its programs in climate and have that person, the, these people be climate faculty as well. So there are fantastic opportunities to build this, um, this new school with this way of thinking. And one of the things that's very clear is that, in, to get back to the building, is that, um, you know, the, the problems of climate are so interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary that you need to brainstorm and think and you need really clever new ideas coming out. And a lot of those ideas are going to come from serendipitous interaction. People chatting, talking over coffee, bumping into each other in the stairwell, whatever it is. And that is going to be the way that you create brilliant new things between disciplines. And so the space that we build 
has to be designed specifically to achieve serendipity. That's exactly what we've got to do. We've got to get that opportunity for people to hang out, talk, listen to talks, you know, have meals together, whatever it is, get introduced to each other. And that's almost like the key part of this climate school building. Of course, we'll need big lecture theaters and, and there'll be an open, the ground floor, which will be huge, will be open to the public and we'll do lots of stuff with the public in that space. Um, but there is that, you know, this, 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 this space that we're creating is going to be transformational in terms of our ability to tackle the climate crisis. Of course, we already have a campus to some extent with Lamont, which is not the river as well, which is where a lot of our science is being done. Um, but this transdisciplinary space that we're creating is going to be um, massively important to us. And I have to say, you know, there's been massive, huge enthusiasm across Columbia University and other schools are recognizing that this creation of this climate school is going to have a big impact on them, very positive impact on them, that will allow them to recruit new people who might not otherwise come to Columbia. Um, but also, similarly with the climate school, we're going to be able to recruit people because we've got this fantastic engineering school, et cetera, that we can work with together. So it's a, it's a, it's a big, um, it's a very exciting thing. But finally, just to say, we're going really fast at this again on the building front, which a, aiming to move really, really quickly to get this building up. And at the same time, um, and, and to go back to your original point about what's the structure of the school, that's all being designed. Last year, we had all the stuff around getting approval within the university, changing the statutes of the university. Um, to reflect the climate school. Now we've got that approval. We're going flat out to actually design the way we're going to do these big interdisciplinary units within the university that are going to be focused specifically on things like net zero, climate adaptation, social justice issues um, going forward. So that's what, that's what we're building right now. And, and I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of really interesting comments in the chat and questions in the, in, in the questions. And I think it, it reflects something that I know we've talked a lot about of, you know, who, who wants to be trained in climate science and who wants to be, who are, who is our next generation of students. And so to that end, there's a lot of, of conversation here in the chat about, are there going to be executive programs? Will there be online programs? Do we need to come to America? Will we, will we go to other programs? Which I, I think is very exciting to see because it sounds to me like, many people want to engage um, and learn with uh, the expertise that we are building and, and have in place at, Colum at Columbia. So maybe talk a little bit about that because I know so many of your plans are looking at a diverse portfolio of educational, uh, obviously not next month, but as we plan going forward, what's that portfolio of educational programs gonna look like and will there be opportunities for many different types of students to engage? Because I think I see a lot of interest in that in the, in the questions. Ruth, do you want to answer? Sure. So, uh, so yes to everything that is in the chat is something that we are uh, focusing on and working towards. I don't want to, um, I don't want to create the expectation that these will be available, you know, tomorrow. But certainly, very high on the priority list is uh, executive programs, um, international. Uh, you know, online courses and internet direct developing curriculum uh, that can be used internationally, creating opportunities where everyone does not need to come to New York, uh, very high on the agenda. As, as we've said so many times, this is, uh, you know, we can't even think about climate, the issues of climate without thinking internationally. So that that is uh, at the core. So there's so many, such an interdisciplinary um, range of topics, the way that we are thinking about uh, addressing that in the educational programs is to think about what we often think about when in interdisciplinary uh, arena is depth and breadth. So how do we create the breadth that is required to be able to appreciate all of those interdisciplinary aspects of climate, but also create the depth so that the, uh, the, the students who come out of the program have some real skills and depth in, um, in some area. So the way that we are uh, planning to address that is by creating uh, core content that, you know, background core content, but create the opportunities for specializations within, uh, within a degree. So specializations might be uh, climate finance or uh, disaster response 
or, uh, or uh, health or different specializations. The public health, the MPH degree has like 20 I something know, of these. Sure. Yeah, many, many mm -hmm. of these specializations. So these can build over time as, uh, as society requires more and more different kinds of skills. Uh, so our, the, the approach is to start with a set of uh, specializations within the program, which we, we have the capability to offer and which we know are important um, for the workforce and to build, build up over time and create that breadth through the core and depth through the specializations. Great. Great. And I think, I mean, you know, as we've discussed before, Alex, uh, leveraging our global footprint through the global centers provides us with an opportunity to do those executive programs, not degree programs on site in different parts of the world, supplemented with uh, some online uh, components. So I really hope that this is something that we can uh, start uh, doing and perhaps even do it in collaboration with some of our partner institutions around the world. Sure, absolutely. I mean, the executive education in particular is something we'd already we've already started with. Um, we had we formed a partnership with Alliance Bernstein uh, because they wanted to try train their uh, own uh, executives to um, learn about it, and then it became a question of providing education programs to their investors. And so we've started now thinking about how to expand this and, and, and build that out. So there's, we've got lots of interesting ideas around that, which I think will be really important going forward. And you're right, doing it um, virtually is gonna make life a lot easier in terms of reach of people um, around, um, around the world, so. Right. Really? Hey, one, yeah, one question I've seen in the, in, in the Q&A, and I know we're running out of time, and so I, I sort of uh, hate to say this to you it, it, quite like this, but I think as founding deans, I think what, some of the questions in the chat are really, you know, what will success look like to you as, as we build mm -hmm. a climate school? I mean, what will you be proud of um, when you look back to this moment? Um, and I know you're busy doing many things and running as fast as you can, but I think that might be a nice way to, to wrap up this conversation. Great question. <laughs> A success for for us or for the school. So I think the uh, I mean I'm just trying to keep my liver, you know, <laughs> essentially. So um, you know the, I think the uh, so I mean the main thing I think that we have to think about is the um, there are a number of features you would normally think of in terms of uh, measures of success. One is generating a whole bunch of fabulous new graduates who go out into the world. Uh, you can think about all the most impactful nature and science papers you're going to produce on on climate or the big um, thought leader things that we do in other areas. Um, but if we actually haven't really affected the climate change issue in some way, then I think it's something where we will think we've failed. And the whole idea of the school is not just to educate and research, even though that is profoundly what a university needs to focus on. Um, we are very much focused on the fourth purpose, as President Bollinger calls it, having impact in the world and taking our work and delivering impact rather like the International Research Institute for Climate and Society and Lisa Goddard's work you mentioned at the beginning, Safwan. Um, that is quintessential what the Earth Institute is all about. It's why I came to Columbia and it's why we're building this school. And it's not just because we want to do research and education. We want to actually really be able to have an impact on people's lives uh, through partnerships, through working with communities uh, and through um, providing the kind of platform that you need here in New York to discuss and debate these issues. Um, you know, if we can't do it here, you can't do it anywhere. This is the easiest place and the best place to be doing it. And with you, Ruth, Mo, and Jason at the helm, um, you know, if, if, if this is bound to be successful, uh, if it ever has any chance of succeeding. Uh, it is under the tutelage of the four of you, really. I mean, I mean that very, very sincerely as a colleague and as um, somebody who I think, you know, speaks for a lot of people um, who know this. Um, I want to thank you. I want to thank uh, Mo in absentia again. I want to thank you, Julie, for your wonderful partnership, as always. Um, make a great team, you and I. Uh, doing these things and um, Alex and Ruth, you know, the work that you do uh, is just amazing and 
I'm in mean, awe of you and, and of your accomplishments. And thank you so much for taking the time uh, to be with us today. And I want to thank also our uh, audience for tuning in. And I would also like to acknowledge uh, Tom Trebat, who's the director of our Rio Global Center, and Karen Poniatric, who runs the Santiago Center, uh, with Chris Molinari in Santiago and Ahmed Musa in Amman uh, for helping put this together, uh, and Marika Olson in New York. Uh, but I also uh, want to remind our audience that this is one of a number of webinars uh, that the global centers have produced on climate change and on environmental issues. And Ruth, you participated in a couple of those. So I encourage all of you in the audience to explore the Global Center's YouTube channel and our webinar library for other learning opportunities with global experts. Uh, links to both of those are in the, in the chat. Um, so we have uh, lots of challenges ahead of us, uh, but we have also lots of optimism um, and hope um, and hard work. So thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> well, thank, thank you, you Safran. Thank you, thank Julie, you. I really appreciate it. Great, Cheers. thank you to everyone who joined. Yes, wonderful. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Take Bye. care. Bye. Okay.